Today, we're going to talk about long exposures, the life of a creative, and a bunch of other stuff with my buddy, the host of Hands-On Photography, it's Ant Pruitt. Hi again. Welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. Nice to have you here for this show. And boy, have I got a show lined up for you. First of all, I do want to let you know, as you go through this show, especially if you're listening on the audio-only version, and I don't know why I looked you in the eye and pointed at you, because if you're looking listening to the audio version, that's kind of meaningless at this point. But beside that, if you want to see the show notes for today's show, if you're interested in seeing the actual photograph that we're going to be discussing for today's show, all you got to do is go to the website. It's at BehindTheShot.tv. You'll find everything there. Find this episode. I wrote a little blurb about my guest like I always do, and this one I actually had a lot of fun. This is a, a somewhat long one. If you are new to this show, wherever you're getting it right now, the show is available in either audio or video format wherever you get your podcast, and the video is also available on YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, so YouTube shows me some statistics, and according to YouTube, a lot of you that are watching are not subscribed. So if you do like what you're seeing, make sure you head down, hit the subscribe button, click the bell, choose all. That way you know every time we do something like the critique shows I do with Don Komarechka, or for that matter, when I release a normal new show like this one. And again, appreciate all the support everybody does, the reviews you guys drop, all of that stuff. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into my guest today really quick because he should have been on long ago, right? And he's... <laughs> Do that again really quick before I do your formal intro, because that was classic. Uh, this, my friends, is photographer and IT pro and writer and blogger and YouTuber and podcaster and everything else on our all around creative fun guy. And sometimes I'm an Oompa you, Loompa, apparently. Sometimes I'm an Oompa Loompa, apparently. <laughs> you look really good. You're looking good. How I are can, you, man? I am unbelievable. How about you, sir? I'm doing very, very good. Thank you very much. I appreciate your doing this. I should have had you on long ago. You have been on the critique shows, though. Mm -hmm. I have, and I've enjoyed doing that, sitting down with you cats, you and Mr. Kamarechka, and just listening to how everybody breaks down the, the photographs uh, with three different perspectives, even though it's one photograph. is is very, very interesting and fascinating. And remind me, I am going to bring up your podcast in a minute, because you do your own like viewer critiques. Is that right? Yeah, I do every now and then. I get a lot of feedback from our listeners and I just say, hey, if you're curious to have something critique, just send it over and let me know in writing that, hey, it's okay for me to critique this on air or I'll just critique it back to them via email. Yeah, and and that's one of the things I love about your podcast. You know, let me, let me wait on the podcast because I have other questions for you. As I introduced you, I mentioned... And I started with photographer, but the second thing I mentioned was IT pro. Uh, <laughs> you have an enterprise IT background. I mm -hmm. have an IT background. I still do IT for, for quote unquote, a real job. And there's a bunch of people like that. And I'm, I guess my question for you is, why is that? What is it? I've tried to figure this out, by the way. And I think I know the answer. But why do, because I'm guessing a lot of other people out there are the same way. Why do so many IT or tech type geeks end up in photography? Well, you said a key phrase or a key term, geek. Um, geeks, regardless whatever the field is, geeks sort of like to um, master whatever it is at, at, at from top to bottom. I don't care if it's a geek in music. I don't care if it's a geek in food, you know, gastro stuff, you know, they, they want to master that on every level. And on the tech side of things, um, tech geeks like to figure out how things work. And sometimes that ends up being a camera. And when you pick up a camera and figure out how things work from uh, dealing with photons and how all of that is processed within milliseconds and Next thing you know, you go down this rabbit hole of, okay, what happens if I turn this dial? Okay, what if I turn this dial two more clicks? And, you know, then it, then it just keeps just keeps going. And then you're in that rabbit hole. And next thing you know, you're making shots of your own. And you realize, okay, I, not only do I like the inner workings of this, this piece of equipment, but I like the output as well, you know? Yeah. You, you hit on a couple of things I think are, are key. Like to me... The key thing about photography, I, I tell people, had I only known that photography, because I didn't, I really didn't, 
Had mm-hmm. I only known the, the the geekery part of photography, I would have gotten – I got into it very late in life. And I would have gotten into it way sooner had I had a clue that that existed because one of the things you said was, you know, you wonder what this knob will do. Mm-hmm. When almost every programming book I've ever picked up, and in some cases to a point where it bothers me that they always go down – the sample code they always have you write are mathematical problems. And it's like, well, right. I, I have a program I want to write that doesn't require the mathematical pro- problem in this case. But to learn this particular language, you're going to make me revisit you yeah. know, high school hell. So, yeah. <laughs> But in a way, that's it, right? We, we think in these problem-solving ways, understanding light, figuring out how things work, mm-hmm. which then brings us to the fact that you are a photographer. Yep. And I've I've looked at your photography. You post Bless your heart. A lot of <laughs> a lot of people do. <laughs> you post a lot of your work. And I'm curious because I see so many different genres that you post. I see emphasis in certain areas, like mm-hmm. street. Mm-hmm. But you post a lot of portraits. What what when somebody says to you, Oh, you're a photographer, what do you shoot? Your answer is what the client needs. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I shoot what the client needs. Um, and that comes from just my general day-to-day life and background, Steve. It, it's When I got into IT, however many years ago that was, I started at the service desk, um, you know, the low end of the spectrum regarding the world of IT. And while I was there, I made it my business to dabble in a little bit of everything because I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could. I didn't necessarily want to be a master developer or anything like that, or a master uh, infrastructure manager to, to manage networks, but I wanted to know just enough. And so whenever questions came into my service desk, which I eventually ended up managing, um, I wanted to be able to answer uh, intelligently when, when those questions came in. And that just further helped me throughout my IT career because I, I dabbled in a little bit of everything. And when I got out of the service desk side of thing and went to um, tier two support, it really helped because I could stare at stupid databases and, and code and open up a Linux terminal. And uh, I don't miss that stuff at all. See, but, but you say tier two support and my heart light lightens up. <laughs> because doing what I do as an independent IT consultant, mm-hmm. I have clients call all the time that can't get anywhere you know, with support. Right. And I, I joke with people, really, the reason I make big bucks per hour is because I can do a Google search better than almost anybody because no two scenarios are the same. <laughs> but so one true. of the things is I also know when you hit a wall to ask. Right. I uh, appreciate your time. What do I need to do to get escalated to tier two? Well, you know, we don't do that until X, Y, Z. Okay, so let's go through X, Y, Z now, and then you'll be able to do it. And and understanding that process, we just shared the secrets. We shouldn't have done that. So <laughs> your photography, as I look through your website, right? Yep. AntPruitt.com. As I look through your website, I, I always, when I look through people's websites, and it's whether they're on this show or not, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It's kind of a thing I got watching Scott Kelby do website reviews and some other people do website reviews. I look for common threads, right? I don't want to see 20 pictures, get 10 in, and then on number 11 go, whoa, right? which photographer shot this? Because it clearly doesn't go with the rest, right? Right. When I look through your website and through your work as a whole, I see a common thread. And I don't know that you will see it, but I joked about it in the green room when something happened with the camera. Mm-hmm. When I look at your work, I see mystery. <laughs> now, before I say why, do you do you understand why I say that? Well, I'm going to assume is because uh, again that that that's part of my personality. Um, you know, when when someone asks what type of photographer I am, what type of work that I shoot, again the, the answer is is whatever the client needs. You know, heck, we got a workshop coming up here in the fall and. I'm going to be handling the street photography side of it and the cityscape side of it, even though I can shoot portraits, you know, I can shoot food, but hey, client needs right. <laughs> street photography. So that's what we're going to give them. But my personality, I, I always sort of lean with the, 
I'm a, I'm a privacy focused type of person. I don't, I don't talk a lot. Um, I know that's hard to believe considering I host my own what shows. What you do for a living. You yeah. know, <laughs> I, I don't talk a lot. I don't share a lot of things. Um, and I, I have found that when I'm shooting certain subjects, I do have a bit of a mysterious feel after I click the shutter and more so when I go into post-processing because the colors tend to come out a little bit on the bluer side and colder, you know, cooler side of things. Yep. Um, and it's, and it's, it's not just, just that. It's your lighting too. So when yeah. I see you post a lot of self-portraits or, or portraits or whatever, and mm -hmm. you're like me, you see, I shouldn't say that. I mean, you, you appear from my side to, to, to think like I think. Mm -hmm. You see dramatic light. Right. So right. sometimes I think it's because of my color blindness that I, I see what other people would see in color contrast, red mm -hmm. apples in a green tree. I don't see that contrast. Right. right. So I make up for that with real contrast, right? Edge mm -hmm. contrast as it were. Yep. And that's what I see. The way you, the way you light portraits, the way you, I'm not going to say light a scene because when you're doing street, you're not necessarily lighting it, but you're picking it. No, I'm and picking the way it. You You're right. <laughs> choose a scene. I even see it in some of your video stuff. Yeah, I it, again, it's I, I like mystery, but you said another key term is contrast. Um, I love on the portrait side of things. I love lighting a scene, lighting a person um, that's going to give them just enough contrast to shape them, uh, especially when you're dealing with someone that has some real strong features in their face, you know, Queen Pruitt, um, she has strong cheeks, just puffy cheeks and beautiful voluptuous lips. Okay. That's no secret. So whenever I light her for a shot, uh, cause I tend to use her a lot here recently because of COVID-19, right. um, as a model for the show, I try to make sure however I set that key light up, that, the feathering is going to be just right to accentuate um, those features. And it's usually because that feather is providing additional contrast without me having to push a slider in post. It's already done for me. And if I'm doing street, it's pretty much the same thing. I'll walk around the street and you know how it is. The sun will, will move just super duper fast, you know, and the light's going to change within a few minutes. And I'm looking around that scene and I'll find that spot of contrast and, and, all right, I'm parking right here and set up and go. And it's the reason I tell a lot of people, you know, it, it, we've had the big super moons lately and they're, those are cool, but really the best moon shots you get aren't the full moon. Right. The best moon shots you get are a quarter moon, I love the half crescent. moon, three quarter moon. I love because if you crescent. think about it, it's sunlight and it's coming at an angle. You're using <laughs> mm -hmm. dramatic, you're, you're moving your soft, soft box to not be what is effectively flat light. So I've shot a lot of moon shots and I have a bunch of them in my little stock gallery and the crescent is by far my favorite yep. because it gives you extra contrast of the craters that you're seeing, that you're able to see just the few that you're able to see, you get more contrast. And it it's also so solves one big moon it. problem to me. I What's saw that? a brilliant moon photo uh, yesterday by James Nyhouse, who's the guy teaches astronauts how to shoot IMAX. And we interviewed him for a, a local photo group on Wednesday. And James has been on the show long, long ago, but wonderful guy, super nice guy. And it, there was a moon shot. And one of the problems to me when you photograph a, a moon is regardless of your aperture, it's so far away, your depth of field is very shallow. So inevitably what tends to happen for most people on a full moon is the craters that are around the edge, Soften you can up. see the definition. Mm -hmm. But as it gets to the sea of tranquility or whatever in the middle, there's less definition and less sharpness yeah, because let's be honest, it's a giant round celestial body. The yep. depth of field, it looks flat to you, but it's not. When you make it half or crescent, you solve not part to of mention that problem. you're shooting through atmosphere as well. Exactly. So All of that, that makes a difference. That makes me wonder. IT guy mm -hmm. becomes all around creative. Why? <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't, sorry. I don't oh, it's mean an that easy, to sound, it's an easy, easy yeah, answer, It's like, brother. gee, Steve, make it a little more focused, would you? <laughs> I don't mean that to sound so vast. I really don't. But, but I am curious for you personally, we talked yeah. about in general IT type thing. Yeah. But for you personally, what is it that speaks to you about being a creative? Like you, you use a hashtag a lot, hashtag create and dominate. 
Yep, that's right. You you have a mentality about you that I love in the creative space. Thank you. What is it? Well, it, it create and dominate is about as simple as I can put it because it's not necessarily like a slogan or whatever that you'd see printed on the shirt. I, I try to live that every single day. I try to create content every single day and I try to dominate every single day. And when I say dominate, I don't necessarily mean going out slapping people around or things like that. I mean, if this camera decides to go to the green tent because I accidentally hit the mouse, you know, figure out why in the heck did I hit the mouse, move the mouse out of the way, dominate that situation and and get back to creating. I don't care what it is, just get down and, and create, but dominate the opposition in front of you or uh, task that's in front of you. Just, just dominate it to the best of your ability. That's every single day when I get up, but far as it. getting out it. of it, <laughs> The short answer was, man, I was burned out. I was, I was just super burned out. Um, I started it's a stress noticing industry. it. There's no question. Yeah, I started noticing it several years ago um, when I was in leadership, and just got sick of answering the same old questions um, and dealing with people <laughs> that don't want to listen to authority and all of that and. You know, and what, what drove me nuts is, is a computer is binary, ones and zeros. It's, it, there's no gray area with it. You either clicked on it or you didn't. So you're going to lie to me and tell me you didn't, cl- <laughs> you you didn't just, click on it. You just it. described every conversation with a uh, family member whose name won't be, well, I didn't do it. Well, no, right. really, honestly, the only way that would have happened is if you, well, I didn't click on it. All right. You know, and, and that got so old to me. And, and so it was it was a nice transition to get into the upper tier side of support where I could stare at code and look at the code that a previous developer had worked on and try to figure out the puzzles and stuff. So that that fascinated me and be able to resolve those. But I was ready to get out of IT a long time ago because I've always had a creative heart and creative, you know, sort of soul to me. I've I've, I've been in band uh, I was in band growing up as a kid, played the saxes. I could even play snare. I was in art, did a lot of drawing and sketches and whatnot. I, would, I, I can sculpt, you know, give me a big block of clay. I I can make you something. So you're a natural creative then. You're one of you those. Know, it, it's just, yeah. it was just always in me. Um, and when it was time for me to finally exit the IT world, it was really, really easy to do that. And then I was also getting some encouragement um, right before it even happened. You know, people was like, why are you even here? You know, right. uh, the shot that we're going to talk about today um, happened right around the time one of those conversations happened to me. Uh, See, know, that, that's this- interesting. Because, <laughs> well, but because I really honestly, I, I joke with people, you know me, I, I've been a radio for 40 something years. Mm-hmm. And I did a local TV show here. And one of the things I said in the intro that I was, I'm kind of ad-libbing it, and this came out, and I firmly believe it, and that is we we define the most important moments in our lives by the songs that we're playing at the time. And that, to me, has always been my definition that we all have a creative in us, right? Yeah. We all have an ability to leave a particular, again, I'm going to use your word, binary moment that's happening in our lives. Yeah. And have that moment modified, changed, made better and or worse by the way we interpret it looking back because of the music that was playing or the visuals that we saw. All of this leads to you creating a YouTube channel that's successful. So you put your own content on YouTube, Mm -hmm. tutorials, you know, light modifiers, whatever it is, great educational content. But then you also have your podcast on mm-hmm. the Twit Network. For those people that don't know the Twit Network, T-W-I-T, twit.tv. Mm-hmm. It's a network created by Leo Laporte and his wife. Yep. And some of my favorite podcasts are there. The first podcast I ever subscribed to, Mac Break Weekly, and mm-hmm. the mothership, as it were, Twit, This Twit. Week in Tech. Uh-huh. Um, because again, IT, I always envisioned I'd take my radio background, combine it with my geekery, and go that road down a... Yeah. down a geek type podcast path. Um, and then I ended up in photography, which is weird. But mm-hmm. 
<laughs> hands-on photography. Mm-hmm. I I love the show partially because of how uh, straight to the point it is, right? My show's too long. I go an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. That's not too long. Your, go ahead. <laughs> your show in 15 minutes hits a subject head on and teaches people. If, if I for try. people who don't know hands on photography, what's your what's your helicopter description of hands on photography? And then I'm also curious, how, where's the where's the differences and and overlap if there is any between that and your personal YouTube stuff? Okay, well, with hands on photography, the pitch is to give anybody and everybody access to the world of photography in a friendly, friendly environment and a friendly, friendly language. Uh, I don't want to walk up to someone and that's trying to snap a shot out on the street with their phone and tell them, no, you probably need to speed up your shutter just a little bit because it's really bright out here. I don't, I don't want to be that person. Um, what I want to say is, you know what? Kudos to you for shooting because that phone is clearly capable. So let's keep shooting. Now, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about it, I have some tips for you. You can just tap on the screen to lock the focal point here or, you know, just I try to make it as simple and friendly as possible so people can become more interested in this craft because photography is just I don't know about you, Steve, but when I when I get my camera and I go out for my walks every morning, it's it's just like, oh, the best daggum feeling you know no offense to my family you know i love them with all i got but <laughs> good good you threw that in there i'll leave you know, that part but in. but they hey but they know when it's 6 a.m and they hear the door opening it's it's me going out with my camera because that is it's 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 in me you know so i i hope to bring more people to that emotional side of it as well as the artistic side of it uh but again i i like to try to present it in a much more friendly voice and make it a little bit more bite size because uh, with the internet age, we got a ton of information out there and I think people can get an information overload and, and get confused. And I just say, you know what, let me, let me, I got 15 minutes of your attention. Let me hit it right now. Let me get straight to the point and I hope to see you come back soon. Well, and that by the way, is part of the reason hands-on photography and your YouTube work. Mm. There are times I'm looking for something. And let's be honest, there's a ton of content out there. Yep. And sometimes you'll find something that the content's good, but the presentation is, I, I can't watch. Or yeah. vice versa. Yeah. My God, happens. dude, you have fantastic presentation. How come you couldn't convey a subject to me? Yeah. Right? And, and that happens. Um, you have an ability, though. And I don't I try know, to I, anyway. <laughs> I don't know that it's it's tied to the creative. It may be more personality than than the creative side, but you have an ability to communicate with people in a way that is just like ah, super relaxing and I love that. You say that, Steve, but listen, you, you would you're going to be surprised at what I'm about to say. My background again is I'm I'm sort of uh, introverted and sort of off to myself and you coupled the IT side of things when a problem comes up. Uh, in order for me to solve that problem, I need the facts. I don't need a story. I need the facts. And so over, you know, pretty much throughout my adult life, when I communicate with people, I communicate with, with just flat out facts. Um, and my family laughs at me because when story time comes up, my story time is the shortest ever. Because I get right to the point. <laughs> I don't have all of the crazy details and things like that. I just say, oh, let me tell you what happened today. A, B, C, D, right. period. And they get that. Um, and so when I come to my content creation, that's it's still in me. But I try to smile at least. <laughs> you know, because that's that's something that that helps makes it a little bit more a little less abrasive sounding than what's really going on in my head. Cause when I write my notes out, my notes are just literally like three or four sentences. I'm gonna hit this, I'm gonna hit this, make sure I say this, and then make sure I say thank you. Oh, smile. Yeah, smile. <laughs> you remind me it's what you just said though about you know, I get straight to the point and it's all about facts. You remind me of my friend Adam El Macias. I was judging an image critique 
uh, image competition actually uh, for professional photographers of San Diego once. And I invited him. He lives in San Diego. I invited him to come watch. And I'm watching him in the back. And he's doing this on his phone. And I'm like, ah, he's bored. He's not enjoying it. So when we were done, I said, it looked like you were bored. He goes, oh, no, no. I was writing the, the image titles and the scores down so I could show you what I thought of them. And mm. I don't, he said, I loved the process, but I didn't like the, well, you did this good and you did this good. And then here's what's bad. He goes, I don't have time for that. Here's what's wrong. Here's what you can improve. Right? Just matter of fact. So let's let's go into this image for today because when when we were picking the image, usually when somebody sends me an image uh, that we're going to pick, I look at it and go, oh, I love. I've got questions. It's key that we pick an image. I've got questions on, or the you know doesn't serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. But I've rarely had an image that I look at a part of the image and the title that I'm going to make up for the image is kind of it. But I rarely have an image where I have no idea what the heck I'm looking at. <laughs> I, I, I really win. honest. I mean, I, I kind of have an idea, but I wouldn't I, put, win. I would not put money on it. So for those of you that are watching and have made it this far, once again, I just want to remind you, you can find the show at the website, which is BehindTheShot.tv. If you're listening to the audio feed, go check it out, BehindTheShot.tv. Uh, and then while you're there, find this episode all of the links that we're talking about here in this show, all of Ant's links, by the way, I, I will make sure Ant mentioned he's teaching a workshop in New Orleans coming up at the end of the year, or actually in October. I'm yep. going to be teaching at that workshop. So is a gentleman by the name of Andrew Scrivini, who's going to be teaching the food. I'm doing the music. Ant's doing the street stuff. I'll have a link to that in there as well. And if you're watching on YouTube, boom, go down, make sure you subscribe so that you get noticed notified every episode that we release. So Indeed. let's get into this. <laughs> I call it the blue wave. Does it have a name? Uh, actually, yes. And you're close. It's the blue ghost. The blue ghost. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the thing. There's the mystery again, by the way. Mm -hmm. You shot this shot. You know, you've seen the show before. So, you know, I always try and describe the shot. For. And I can't wait to hear your description because, bro, I got to tell you, you do this so well. <laughs> oh, man, you do this so well. I Thank watch you. your show every daggum weekend when it's up. And I'm like, oh, gosh, how did he do that? You know, Thank so, you. That so, means so, yeah, a I'm, ton. I'm, I'm sitting here ton. like this now. <laughs> ton coming from you. That means so much to me. And yet the added pressure will kill me. So <laughs> this, for those of you that are seeing this or, or if you're listening on audio, I just want you to understand, this is exactly what I mentioned earlier about, about Ant's work. This is mystery. But it's mystery in such a unique, really cool way that you would not normally get. So let me, let me try and set the scene. This is a street scene. Okay, so this is mm -hmm. perfect. What he's teaching in New Orleans, the Wanderers uh, photo expedition workshops, uh, is street photography. And this is a perfect example of the type of stuff that Ant shoots. So it's a street scene. It's at night. That's critical to understand. It's a long exposure. And so when I say nighttime and I say long exposure, two things should hit you. And that is light streaks, you know, light trails, and also kind of a, a city haze because this is clearly a city. And he's standing. I want you to picture standing on an intersection and whatever corner you're on, kitty corner, meaning across the street diagonally, is the background subject which is the Renaissance Hotel. And he was smart enough to shoot this in a way that I can read the name Renaissance Hotel. Absolutely <laughs> critical, in my opinion, to the shot is that I can read that. There's car lights that are streaks that appear to be going from left to right. And what says that to me is I don't see any real other cars on the street, but I see tons of headlights on the left. So whether I'm right or wrong doesn't matter. In my vision of looking at this shot, I see motion of cars coming from left to right. Keep that thought. Motion coming from left to right. There's street lights. I'm saving this blue thing until the end. There's street lights and the street lights are starburst. And I mean starburst like it's F-22 type starburst, which I happen to know it's not F-22, which is kind of freaking me out a little bit because these are like <laughs> perfect starbursts. I mean, it's, it's kind of cool. But here's the thing. The Renaissance Hotel is the background subject. Standard landscape, cityscape type rules apply. 
foreground subject, midground subject, background subject, right? Yep. Background subject is the hotel. Midground subject is those light trails and the other thing I'm going to bring up in a minute. And there's a foreground subject and it's a bicycle. And the bicycle, it's hard to see at first, but if you look closely, there are stickers on that bike mm -hmm. and it's not English. They appear to be an Asian language. I'm, I'm thinking Chinese, something like that. Mm -hmm. Colors, which is interesting because we talked about this a little, just a little while ago, and that is you tend to go vibrant for the contrast. And that makes the shot here, the vibrance that you pull in here. And then, and I don't know even know how to describe this because it's not a blue wave. I want you to picture those of you on the audio or even those of you on the video, I want you to see this. So left side of the frame is open and just above the cars, like about where the first floor would be on the hotel, the blue starts at a point there. And think of it like if I could move camera left here to the other corner and look at this, it almost looks like a line chart, like a, a chart that starts at zero, grows up over like a trend line, grows up very quickly and then levels out and makes a full bar all the way across and exiting the right side of the screen, spreading out and diffusing. And that's what freaks me out, right? If this was just what it is on the left, where it has a clear bottom and a clear top, okay, bus went by. It had a window that was blue, okay, but it doesn't. On the right-hand side, somehow it diffuses higher up into the sky. Why is it doing that? I literally have no clue what made the darn blue wave. How'd I do? You missed one thing, sir. What's that? I purposely uh, angled the, the lens um, and the focal length to where that light streak goes up and to, up to the right of the frame. Above the and light. Into that, and into the corner. Yes, you, and that, that, that is that? true. So this does not go straight across the frame. That's a good point. It actually mm -hmm. starts around the top of the first floor, but where it exits the frame, it's at the top of the buildings. Right. And, and doesn't hurt the starburst streetlight. Right. Which is key, because if it colored the streetlight, that would kill it. What but, is yeah. it? Dude, you, you crushed it. This, this was... <laughs> You crushed it. So many details. Um, but that was an actual bus. But this is a bus that goes really, really, really fast. It surprised me how fast the buses go in the city. <laughs> they Where is this? They take off from the light. This is in Shanghai, China. Ah, okay. So that I was right about the sticker then. Okay. Yes, you are correct. All of those details are from uh, Shanghai, China. And the buses that run there... I don't know what they have in them from a fuel standpoint, but when they hit the accelerator, they are gone. So when what you see there on the left side where the light is a little bit more dense, that's that's its stopping point. That's and a good it, way to word it because it's not see through there either. Yeah, it's not. Right. It's opaque. Right. So as it as it accelerates, it's gone. But I still have the slow enough shutter drag to, to capture the light going past. But it's it's moving, dude. I mean, it's moving. I don't okay. know why those buses go that fast. <laughs> so I, I have to know though, because you're you're telling me that the way you got it, mm -hmm. I wish I had my telestrator set up. I draw on this. You're telling me that the way you got it is on the left, it was stopped. Mm -hmm. Then it went. Mm -hmm. I mean, it must've taken off like a bullet. Gets yep. transparent as it goes through, but the light does raise above street level and go up to, to top of skyscraper level. Mm-hmm. And you're That's telling me it's because you angled the camera, but that doesn't make sense because the buildings, the buildings have a distortion to them, but they all tilt in, mm -hmm. um, almost like a fisheye type in effect. Mm -hmm. But if you angled it, they'd be off center. I'm, I am down on the ground on the sidewalk uh, with the camera pretty much maybe like six inches, six, six inches or so off the ground on, on a tiny uh, gorilla pod. And I tilted it up. But I'm using a wider focal length. I believe I was using like a 24, 24 mil, wow. something like that. Did you, were you aware of that mm -hmm. street light and getting the blue above the street light? Yes. Cause I've watched it go past a couple of times. <laughs> I've watched a couple of buses go by. Uh, this was, this was totally planned even down to the shutter speed. Um, 
I, I believe it's like 13 seconds. Is it X? Like yeah, I think it was 13 seconds. It was either X of data or you sent it to me. But then, okay, but that, I need to know. You're saying it was planned to the shutter speed, mm -hmm. but the bus was super fast, right? So mm -hmm. long exposure photography, obviously the key question on long exposure photography, you're going to drag the shutter. Do you want to drag it 30 seconds? I mean, even when mm -hmm. you're shooting star trails, mm -hmm. you know, people think the standard rule of thumb for star trails is, 30 seconds or less. And it's not, it depends on a number of variables, Depend, including right. which camera you're actually shooting. Yep. So, so that you don't, so that you end up with pinpoint stars, for example, yep. if you're shooting nighttime sky. Uh, and by the way, photo pills app can answer all of those questions for you. It's a fantastic app, but yeah, it is a good app. My question to you then is how'd you know 13 seconds, right? Depending on the speed of this bus, 13 seconds could have been stupid too long or stupid too short. Well, see, that's the thing. I was ideally, I was wanting to shoot maybe like a eight to ten second exposure. Mm, okay. Um, but but I saw the speed of this thing, and I figured if I could go a little bit longer, by the time it's out, that light is just going to sort of dissipate, and I'll still be able to get the starbursts in the back without them being distorted. And it was literally just trial and error. And I said, okay, I'm going to set this to like maybe 13 seconds. Cause I didn't, I didn't, I didn't try 20 seconds or anything like that. I, I stopped at 13. 20. No, this is perfect because <laughs> of the fact that it was short enough that there's no movement in anything, but what matters. Right. And I, I, am I right in assuming I've never actually shot a shot like this. I've never really gone out and done, you know, light trails. Mm -hmm. Am I correct in my assumption that because the bus is moving, f and f I should probably preface this by saying, for those of you that are watching this on YouTube, please be kind in the comments that Steve, you idiot, you've never shot this before? <laughs> um, no, I haven't. So this is going to be, the, everybody out there that shot this is going to go, oh my God, I can't believe he's asking this. But the 13 seconds has to work for the car light trails. Mm -hmm. And the bus light trail, and mm -hmm. because the bus is moving faster than the cars, right? W in a perfect world, the speed of the vehicle is going to change what shutter you want, right? So you're having to find a right. shutter that works for both when that's not natural. Am I correct? Right. See, that's the thing. You have it's a two, it's multiple lanes there in that street. So you could, as you mentioned, the left to right car streaks previously uh, in your description. That's because that's in another lane. So it started out as, you know, the bus and then several cars right behind it. But I knew that bus was going to get out of there. But I also wanted to make sure I could capture some action from the other other vehicles on the backside as well. So I had to keep it open just long enough, but I didn't want to keep it too long. You know what I mean? Manual mode? Always. Okay. I don't know why. I'm a weirdo like that. A no, lot of not. people like to shoot aperture priority, but... I think it goes back to my days of learning and trying to teach myself this skill of photography is, is get in manual and figure out what one two fiftieth of a second looks like versus one, right. One eightieth of a second. Well, um, it's a tool. It's, it, you, know, you know, there are, there are times that, that you need all the wrenches in the toolbox and there's times that you need one screwdriver and, and, you know, our friend Rick Salmon shoots a lot of his bird stuff, mm -hmm. uh, aperture priority. And I found a, a, comment on a youtube video once saying oh never ever shoot birds aperture priority i shared it with you're rick. telling like, rick really? salmon every shot i ever <laughs> shoot of birds is is aperture priority but that okay so you're shooting this in manual uh -huh. i'm assuming automatic white balance though right uh no i typically use a custom white balance again i like a cooler color temperature so, so you do okay i dial but it you in shot raw shot raw mm -hmm. okay uh, but f11 raw. F11 and ISO 100. The F11 is interesting to me because well, the, the starburst the, that you did get, I mean, I've shot F22 and F11 to get starburst. Like when I'm on a stage and I want to, I want to starburst yeah. the, the stage lights, for example. Yeah. But the starburst you got is not normally an F11 starburst in my head. Maybe at no. 24 millimeters, it would be, but. No, you're right. Um, because I normally would have started around F18, F22, something like that. But the problem is with that particular lens, the sharpness quality starts to degrade oh. as I go up that higher. 
So what I try to back this? down. Uh, I believe it was a 24 to 105. 24 oh, to F4. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I figured that if I'm anywhere around F8, I'm pretty sharp. So I don't try to deviate too far from F8, regardless of the aperture I'm going to use. And that's how I ended up with, with the uh, F11. And F11, by the way, we were talking about the moon earlier. Great starting mm-hmm. point if you're going to shoot the moon. Yeah. Uh, is F11. This was, the main I, thing, though, was the ISO when I, when I was setting this up, because a lot of people will want to crank their ISO because it's nighttime and it's dark. For me, when I'm shooting scenes like this, I know if I push that ISO to, say, F400 along those lines, it's going to give me way more sky than I want. And in this, in this scene, I, I didn't want too much of the sky to come through. I wanted it to be a bit of a shadowy scene. I wanted to, I wanted the buildings to be, you know, a little bit more. There it is. More There's mysterious. the dramatic. I was talking <laughs> the mystery that I was talking about because around the buildings, the only thing you have, the buildings are super dark, but you see the lights in the buildings around it's just the buildings. Lights. It's light pollution. Mm-hmm. It's all it is. There is no light in the sky. It's clear. You're getting the, the, the normal cityscape, you know, right. halo going up. And a um, lot of, and there's nothing wrong if someone wants to do F400, F, I mean, not F400, uh, ISO 400 or ISO 800 in this scene. It's, it's totally fine. Um, but I just didn't want that. I wanted a different mood. Okay. But is there, in your, in your experience with long exposures, mm-hmm. is there a sweet spot for both shutter and aperture that you like? I mean, let's assume because it's, we're talking long exposure, that you can stay at ISO 100 because you're going to expose whatever you need anyway, right? Is right. there a sweet spot you like to stay in range-wise for both your aperture and, and, well, you said aperture, you like to stay around F8. What about your shutter? Shutter speed with long exposure versus ISO. Um, I don't want to crank ISO any more than 800 because uh, it, it's, it's just too bright. It, and it, for most of the things that I shoot, it's just too bright. Uh, if I'm doing like a Astro, yeah, I'll crank it up a little bit more because I want that that extra vibrant color in the sky. Right. Um, I haven't shot Astro in about two years, though. Boy, it's about, I'm about due to do that. Um, but yeah, it, I'd rather stick around 800 or lower just because I like to be able to play around with the with the dark background. What What about shutter? Uh, that depends. <laughs> that depends. Um, if ideally you would go ten seconds, you know that's plenty of time for for light streaks. If you're on a tripod, that's that's plenty of time. Uh, but if so if somebody longer, was if somebody had never done this mm-hmm. type of shot, and they wanted to try just light streaks of a car, ISO as low mm-hmm. as you can. Start around. Tenth of a second. I'm sorry, we're on ten seconds. Ten seconds. And then from there, whatever aperture you need to do your first experiment and get that ten seconds with ISO 100. Right. And then the aperture again. It's all about you know what exactly are you trying to have as a focal point? Because you know the more you open up, the depth of field changes, and you know, and focus starts to go all over the place. I I've found with that lens, if I'm at f8, I'm going to get more things sharp. Um, because I didn't just want that bicycle to be sharp. I didn't just want the light to be the focal point. I wanted people to even see the buildings. And I'm glad you pointed out that you noticed that it was the Renaissance and the Marriott. Um, cause it I wanted that visible. <laughs> cause I it, wanted it that really visible. does because, so let's look at your layout in general, right? Mm-hmm. You got the subject in the foreground, the bike, you've got mm-hmm. the background subject, the hotel mm-hmm. and the rest of the buildings. They all have a distortion of pin cushioning in a little right. bit at the top, which leads you up and, and kind of lets that ribbon, that, that blue ghost, almost envelop the buildings. Whereas if they right. were true, like a real estate photographer or an architecture photographer, if those were true, <laughs> would kill the shot. Because by, by, by using the lens and the low, low angle that you got, mm-hmm. you give room on the outside of the frame, right? But yep. effectively, the buildings and the bike are all almost centered. Which tried it. <laughs> composition wise can be an issue. But here's what I see in this shot. The shot is balanced by the left to right motion. The fact that I can see the light trails, like I don't know what the ghost is, but the light trails of the cars 
mm-hmm. balance the centered buildings by seeing headlights on the left and my eye follows them. You almost yep. use the light trails as leading lines. That, well, yeah, I, and I like leading lines. Uh, traditionally, a leading line goes through through the scene. but Front to back, yeah. Right, but I, I do like leading lines. But this draws my like eye where them. you want it to go. Are, are you, mm-hmm. as you're shooting this, you're aware of, I mean, are you really honestly aware of foreground, background, left to, are you aware of all that? My main concern was those buses, the buses, because they fascinated the crap out of me. I, I was like, I got to get this because they're lit up and they are really just going fast. And, and that was my main concern. The second concern was the framing. I'm, I'm disappointed that I'm not able to get the full bike into position because uh, you notice the um, the wheels cut off at the bottom. Yep. That's because where I had had my camera placed, I couldn't move back any further. Um Cause it was literally on the corner near a corner store and there were people walking in and out of that corner store and I'm lying and sitting on the ground and I'm in the way, you know? So I, I, I to understand to your point, but here's the thing. <laughs> if you had done anything to do that differently, like let's take a hypothetical, you stuck a 16 millimeter on so that you could get right. the bike. The distortion right. would have been too much. Too much. Right? I agree. It, it really, honestly, the, the distortion of a 16, I mean, unless you corrected it, at which point you'd lose a whole bunch of the effect that you get here. The ability to use the lens and use the, the distortion of that lens to, to effectively make your composition is worth way more to me than the bottom of that bike wheel. Well, I appreciate um, that. Because it still bugs me when I see it. you cut the bike at the right spot. <laughs> Say that again? I'm sorry. I appreciate that because it still bugs me every time I look at the screen. I'm like, dang, I don't have the full tire. You know? Okay, but again... <laughs> Think about where you cut the bottom of the bike, right? Right. Where you cut the bottom of the bike, you didn't cut it at an uncomfortable amputation type place. Right, right. You you shoot this. You take it back, you bring it up on the computer. Yep. What is your normal workflow for photos in general? Lightroom, Photoshop, Capture One, what? I'm a Lightroom first person, but I have used Capture One uh, from time to time. But Lightroom is first because I it's my asset manager and I archive things uh, the way I see fit. Um, so I bring it into Lightroom and just do a quick one over. And I typically go from Lightroom to Photoshop to do any sharpening. Lightroom's sharpening tool is, is fine and it's gotten better as of the time of this recording. It's gotten better. Mm-hmm. But I still get much better sharpening inside of Photoshop um, when I let, need let me, it. Let me interrupt Doesn't, you. don't then. need a lot there, though. <laughs> what are you using? And Are you using Unsharp Mask? Or are you using Smart Sharpen? I'm a high-pass filter person. High-pass filter, uh, okay. You know, I'll use a, a softer Gaussian blur layer and bring in a high-pass filter to give me some frequency separation is generally how I try to so do it. So you're not just duplicating and doing high-pass. You're Gaussian right. blurring it first? Mm-hmm. I blur it first and then I put in the, the um, high pass filter. And if it's something that it's okay with being a little bit soft, I will let that mask just stay there and let it, let it be soft. It just depends on the shot though. Interesting. All right. It's All weird. Right. I know I treat it no, almost like, like I'm it. doing a retouch of a person. Cause that's something you would normally do for a, a model. Um, but I just like to play around with it. Cause sometimes I just saw it's cool. An, I think it was Nicole did, um, I watched a video from her the other day where she talked about how she gets the punch in her images and she had a name for it. And I'm going to, I can't remember it now. I apologize. <laughs> to but it was something to the same effect where she'll duplicate a layer and she'll, she'll Gaussian blur it almost like a frequency separation type thing. Yeah. And then she'll bring it back in a blend mode at which point the edges are gone, but the colors yeah. are there. Right. And she'll bring that in at about 30% or so, or whatever, you know, overlay opacity she wants. And it just boosts the colors. And it was actually a really, Cool trick. Mm. So in an image like this, what would you have done? Uh, from a, Oh, for the post process side. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, I, I would, I would want to have some sharpening right there in the center where the uh, lower floors of the hotel are. Uh, Cause I want some detail there, but the top, I would let that be a little bit soft because of the additional light pollution. It gives you a, uh, implied haze if you will and when you look at through haze it's a little bit softer and then the bike and then the the bike i definitely wanted that to be you know 
as crispy as possible, but not necessarily steal the show from the ghost. I wanted people to see the bike, but I didn't want it to steal the show. Which is a balancing act you pulled off here, by the way. That uh, that's, that I should have mentioned that, and that is, I can read Renaissance. I didn't think about this. I can read Renaissance. I I saw the stickers on the bike. They're visible. I understand them. I can see definition even in Windows, but nothing. And I mean, they're sharp. I'm not saying even that they're soft. I don't know why this is even working, but the <laughs> the blue wave still overpowers them from a point of view of drawing the viewer's eye, right? The, the, the sharpness right. in those isn't competing is the word I'm looking for. Right. If, and you know, uh, the human eye goes to light and it goes to color. Right. And that blue wave right there, it, it'll, it'll automatically hit you because it's, it's, it's so pronounced and stands out on this one. Well, and again, it's so wild. <laughs> like I started. I wish you could have seen it. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I, in my head, when, when I first saw this thing, I'm trying, I'm going, I, it's got to be a bus, right? It's got to be a bus. Yeah, it's but a I bus, but it's not your it. typical bus. <laughs> no, it's wild. It's just wild. So if somebody were to start long exposures after watching this for the first time ever, mm -hmm. what's your one tip for long exposures? Tripod and patience. Um, cause you can sit up, sit, you can set up your camera in a location and click that shutter and, and 10 seconds go by, <clears throat> pardon me, 10 seconds go by and nothing really happens on the frame. You, you, you just have to wait it out. Uh, that was, again, that was a planned shot. I knew the buses were coming up and down that street pretty frequently. So I said, okay, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait and I'm going to test to see what shutter speed is going to work better than the other shutter speeds. And when that next bus, that's going to be my quote unquote money shot or whatever, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to have my settings dialed in. And that took, you know, a good hour or so of just hanging around and watching the buses go by. Yeah. Well, I, I again, I dig it. Just such a cool <laughs> shot, man. It's such a cool shot. So last question. And most mm -hmm. people don't know this question before it comes up, but you already do. Is there a photographer or artist or a creative out there that people may not know about, or for that matter, may know about, doesn't matter. Is there an artist or a creative out there that you think, look, if you're not already following this person, you really should, who would <laughs> it be? Well, there's two that come to my mind immediately. Okay. Um, actually three. I'll take that Let's back. Let's do all three. three. Uh, the first one is Brian Manier. Brian Manier is a graphic artist, but he's also a hell of a photographer, and he's now a Fuji ambassador, Fuji film oh, ambassador. Nice. And he, he takes a lot of moody landscape shots, and he has a very, very particular color palette that he uses for all of his shots. If I spot his shot online somewhere, um, I know it's his because of the color palette that he uses. It's a lot of, a lot of, um, purple magenta and blue, similar to the stuff that I, <laughs> that I like. Um, but he's really, really, really good. Um, okay. That's number, number two. one. Number two happens to be a twit listener and listener of hands on photography. His name is Jim, merely Jim on Twitter. And he's just a hobbyist photographer. He takes around his smartphone and he just shoots a lot of really, really fascinating stuff down in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, a lot of shots at bars, a lot of cityscape shots. And it's just when the mood strikes him, he pulls his phone out and he frames it up and shoots it. And he does his processing and Snapseed right there on the phone. And Nice. And it just, he gets me every single time. And okay. I got to give him his props. And the last one is, uh, his name is Joseph. I can't pronounce his last name properly. So I know it's Joseph, but his handle is bite for bite as in computer bite, bite is for bite. Is that the F O R Twitter. or the number four? Oh, four, um, words F O R for okay. four. I'll find the links and, and, and they'll be in the, the show notes. So he, he's another listener of the twit network. Um, he listens to my show and he's in, I believe he's in Brooklyn, but he uses a point and shoot and he uses a, a Fuji, XV 100, I believe. And he's, he's, he's shooting traditional street photography with that middle to wide 
um, focal length and it's just capturing what's happening there in New York City, considering everything that's going on from the pandemic. And he just has a great way of using color to tell his stories as well. Um, so every time I see his shot, I always know, OK, that's mm, that like that would be like a Coney Island scene or something, you know, and it, right. and it usually is. And he's he's really, really talented. OK, um, so again, all those links will be in the show notes. And by the way, it's probably going to be in there because there's no way to cut it out, but I accidentally just moved my mouse. We were talking about accidentally hitting things into the corner, <laughs> which started a screensaver and went black and I'm capturing the screen. So if you see the black blink, that's Steve. It's quite uh, all right. Yeah, it's, there's that. But all those will be in there. And as well, uh, real quick, uh, hands-on photography. So it's twit.tv slash hop. That's right. H-O-P for hands-on photography. I will make sure as well the New Orleans workshop, the Wanderers workshop that we're doing mm-hmm. with Andrew, you, me, and Freddie Clark, uh, mm-hmm. Santee Photo on on Twitter and everywhere. Uh, I'll make yep. sure the links for that are in the, the blog post as well. Uh, but just so people can find you, your website is? AntPruitt.com. Okay. Straightforward Two T's. and simple. <laughs> AntPruitt.com. And then yep. Twitter and Instagram, there's an underscore between them. That's correct. Ant underscore Pruitt on both of those platforms. Okay. YouTube, no underscore, just Ant Pruitt. No underscore. Yeah, YouTube is just youtube.com slash Ant Pruitt. That was a lot. And then again, the Twit Network. And and we should, you know, I'm mentioning hands-on photography before we close out. I should mention, that's not the only show you do there, right? (laughs) Your tech background comes into play. What are some of the other shows on the Twit Network in case somebody has an interest in one of the titles and says, oh, let me check that out. What are some of the other shows you do on Twit? Sure. Well, I, I co-host a show called This Week in Google, where uh, if you listen to the, that title, you would assume it's all about Google, when in actuality, it's more about big tech. So we'll talk about Google. We'll talk about Amazon and, and Facebook and Twitter and all of them, and just a lot of things happening in the tech space from a journalistic standpoint. And we share a lot of opinions. Uh, it's the three of us that sit Sit, sit around the mics is Mr. Laporte, myself, Mrs. Stacy Higginbotham, and Mr. Jeff Jarvis. Um, we really enjoy hanging out with each other, and we will have some serious discussions about some of the things happening in the tech space. And we'll also have a lot of fun, too. So that's okay. one show. And then the other show is Hands on Tech. Uh, I am a co-host there with our other host, Jason Howell and Micah Sargent and Mr. Laporte. And that's where we'll review... Uh, Just different consumer technology devices. I I tend to focus more on the content creation side of things. Um, I've reviewed and demoed several different laptops, several different cameras. Uh, My Sony A1 demo is going up on Wednesday as the time of recording this. I believe it's the 5th of May. So um, you can check that out. But to make it easy for everybody, we have a feed that's just called Total Ant on Twit. And so for every show that I am in, um, you can subscribe to that feed and it will download to your podcast application of choice. Oh, I like that. That's a smart <laughs> move. Okay. So again, Ant Pruitt, twit.tv slash hop or all the other shows. And then, of course, antpruitt.com, Ant Pruitt on YouTube. Subscribe to his YouTube. Let's get the YouTube count going up here. <laughs> and again, my friend, it is so good to see you always. I'm really looking forward to New Orleans and the Wanderers Workshop that we're doing. That's going to be a lot of fun together uh, uh, in October when the world yep. hopefully stops ending and gets back to normal. And it's looking that way. So if you're interested in that, people, that's very limited space. Yep. So get on that one. Links are in the show notes for this as well. Thank you, my friend. Mr. Brazel, thank you so much. It is, this is, I love your show. I've told you before, I watch it pretty regularly. <laughs> and I always look forward to hearing how you describe the photos to people that aren't watching the video. That is a skill, my man. And, and you crush it's, it. Uh, it's one of the fun parts. And to everybody else, again, speaking of photos, if you want to see the photo that we talked about today, head up to the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. If you want to find me, that's easy as well. SteveBrazel.com. It's like the country Brazil, but it's two L's. And then if you want to follow on social media, I, I don't really use Facebook anymore. The page is still there. If you want to go follow it, go follow it. But uh, <laughs> other than that, I'm usually on Twitter. Twitter is my favorite spot and Instagram as well. It's at Steve Brazel on either one or at Behind the Shot TV on either one. And to, again, to everybody, thank you so much for subscribing, for the reviews, for everything that you guys do. 
to support this show because it makes it all worth it. Again, thank you to my guest this time around, Mr. Ant Pruitt. We will see you on the next show. 